Good morning. It is uh, January 5th? 5th. Yes. 5th, Thursday. And we are continuing our discussion of the causes of the Civil War. So I just want to give a couple of uh, minutes to reinforce yesterday. <clears throat> because you, that's the big idea. You can organize all this information with this thesis or this explanation I want you to be able to do. Um, so as you are preparing, as you're preparing for the test, I want you to think of it this way, be able to explain why did the southern states leave the Union? Okay, why? And it starts with your, um, your timeline. There's going to be a number of incidents, issues, events, laws, etc., beginning around 1850 and culminating in 1861 with secession and the war. Okay? And remember the paradigm, what's going on in the North and the South, the attitudes. So we got, again, it's polarization um, or radicalization. You have the radicals on the sides, on both sides. It's in the sections, the North and the South, generally. Um, over here, the, the radicals are the secessionists, or we call them fire eaters. Here you have the abolitionists, and then you have the, the two divisions in the north. And this is kind of difficult for some, some kids, so think about it this way. You have two, you have three groups in the north. The A are the abolitionists. The B group are the no expansion, no expansion people. And then the, third, the C group is the don't care group. And those guys are like the Democrats and the Whigs in the North who have different values, different issues. They're pro-business. They're, um, you know, development. They're still in the American system a little bit. They're the railroad. So they're not really into or care about the slavery issue, okay? So you got the three groups. You clear on that? Yeah. Lincoln is the no expansion. These guys are moderates, okay? The abolitionists are the ultra-radicals. They don't compromise, you know, etc. cetera. Um, the Southerners, it's much more... Um, broad-based pro-slavery. That's the big idea. Now, what, what you will see is there will be some that are uh, compromise. They'll, they'll have some that will say, well, let's compromise. John C. Calhoun will be one of them. He'll say, we compromise as long as we can maintain the union, our status is okay. But at beginning in 1850, when the balance of power shifts with California, you're going to get more and more people saying, well, we can't really compromise. We're going to have to go on our own. Do you get that? So, so that's the thesis. The, the country divides, becomes more radical, no compromise. They don't compromise, and they don't compromise. So the country is going to be more polarized as time goes on through the 1850s. So it's very important that you pay attention to, well, here's an event. What is the view of the abolitionists? What is the event of the no, ex the view of the no expansion? What is the view of the don't care? That's, if you can analyze that, which is you should be able to, that's going to be very easy to understand all of this. What's the view of the Southerners on that issue? That's what I really want to reinforce that you, if you can do that, that's going to be very helpful. It, it shows you really understand it. And you can write about it then. Yeah. Okay, question. Were there any don't care Southerners? Uh, yeah. Or like very few? Yeah, for sure. Um, not so powerful at all. Remember, the, who are the people running the South? are the plantation owners, the planter class. So they're dominant. Um, but it's just like people, you know, 
poor people vote Republican and they always vote for lower taxes on, on the rich, right? Because they think someday they're going to be rich and they want lower taxes. It's kind of like the poor whites in the South. Most people didn't own slaves, but they were going to fight and die for slavery. Or at least, you know, they, they want that chance for slaves. They don't want to up, up, the upheaval, remember? Okay. Um, so you got this? So should we give you an example of how you should think about this? So, for example, Harriet Beecher Stowe, I think it's around 1856, is Uncle Tom's Cabin, right? So, your job would be to say, okay, well, what would the Southerners say about Uncle Tom's Cabin? How do they uh, view it, and what is, how does it fit into this uh, paradigm? Well, first of all, they hate Uncle Tom's Cabin because it makes them look like they are evil, horrible people. So they say, oh my, we did that yesterday, did I do that yesterday? They say, oh my goodness, is that how they see us? You know, they think we are these horrible people in this horrible book. The Southerners don't see themselves as horrible. They say, you know, they, I think, um, well, they, no, they're going to say slavery is just the way our system is. And, you know, they will see themselves as not as being benevolent masters. You know, they're gonna we have to take care of our slave. They're like children. They can't take care of themselves. And we have to show them. I mean that's the that's a dominant, dominant attitude. Okay. So they're gonna it's gonna polarize them, it's gonna push them towards the radical because they are attacked. They'll feel attacked in that book justifiably so they are the book is a, is a really horrible depiction of slavery there's no doubt about it you can't read that book and go oh wow slavery's pretty fun yeah you know you can't it's very hostile to it's portraying these people as horrible people and the slaves as victims and etc was the book like using like exaggerations or was it like being pretty accurate let's put it this way uh, you know the movie 12 years a slave have you guys seen it? Yeah. Seen Raise your hand you have not seen it. I haven't seen it. We really need to watch it. It's, it's, watch it's, it's no. <laughs> well, we could. Hey, I could stop now. We could watch it for the next two weeks, but I'm still giving you the tests. Okay. We can take a Yeah? Yeah. I'm going to give you tests on all the stuff that I would have taught. You still have to know it. I don't care. I can go into semi retirement. <laughs> anyway, so the point is, um, 12 Years a Slave is similar to Harriet Beecher Stowe book. The guy who wrote 12 Years a Slave was a, was a slave and was an abolitionist. Okay, so there's a little bit of, you have to be a little bit skeptical. But I would say, just like in that movie, there were, everything in that movie is accurate. There, things like that did happen. But... It wasn't always that way. So I would say the same thing for Harry Beecher Stowe. Yeah, there were horrible extremes and definitely in slavery. Yeah. Was it always horrible all the time for all slaves? You know, it was a diverse experience. You know, a, a, Mar a slave in Maryland in a, in a town and you were, you know, you, one person owned one, you know, one slave would be a very different experience than a Mississippi plantation, massive plantation, you know, different, different levels of like uh, supervision and some slaves had their own, you know, quarters, some had to live in the house, some lived in, you know, way off, didn't, you know, really interact with whites at all, some, you know, work for wages and could buy their freedom and this is very very diverse is the idea but and that reminds me to this this book if you're interested in like slave life there's two chapters I copied and I'll offer this to anybody who wants it one is about average what's the daily life or life of slaves in um, the different contexts what was their religion like what was their marriage what was their family relationships how do they interact with um, whites, what was the education, what is the typical slave life. So there's a chapter on that. And there's a chapter on, well, how do they control them, the black codes, the plantation system, and things of that nature. So if you're interested in that, this is a really good resource. So let me know if you guys want that. I'll, I'll give you a copy of it. 
Anyway, do you see how you have to see this? How do the abolitionists see Uncle Tom's Cabin? They're going to go, wow, this is so wonderful. It's such a popular book. Hundreds of thousands of copies were sold. It energized more and more people towards the anti-slavery movement. Yeah, slavery is bad. Okay. Um, so there's, they're supportive of it. The don't cares, don't care. Eh, whatever. Get it. But if you were like generally predisposed to be against slavery and you're totally against slavery, you were strengthened those people. Okay, got it? So that's how I want you to organize this information and to think about it. I really should make you do it like it's a kind of worksheet. I'm going to have a worksheet. So do it on your own. Just think about it. How would the Southerners view? How do the abolitionists? How do the. And you will see. This divide gets larger and larger as this goes, as 19th century or 1850s goes, this divide spreads and spreads, and then there's no compromise in the middle. There's no more, hey, let's, we're all Americans. Get it? And then therefore we get the war. Yeah? If Uncle Tom's Cabin never came out, do you think the whole Civil War and abolition movement would be a lot more delayed? Like, I, it would have obviously happened sooner or later, but do you think it... Interesting question. Historians hate those kind of questions because it doesn't matter. It didn't happen. So what matters for historians is what did happen. So that's a bad answer. Adam? Uh, I was just going to say, uh, I think Lincoln winning the nomination is a big part of the Civil War. Oh, yeah. That when we get to it, we'll show you the, the political dimensions. Um, you heard the, the speech, a house divided against itself cannot stand. That was in the reading. That is uh, kind of the view is that it, we were so divided fundamentally since the founding of America, the colonial era, we were divided on this issue. And they didn't take care of it then, and it just is the divisions are deeper, deeper, deeper. Um, and if there's no compromise, there's war. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so let's see. The significance of this is um, there's four million slaves in the South. So it's 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 basically suggesting that um, the slave. Uh, establishment of slavery was so strong. Four, Two billion dollars in value in slavery. The southerners are tied to that system. It's not going away. They want to keep it at all costs. That's kind of what the significance. Even in some states there's a much larger population of blacks or a larger population of blacks compared to whites. So there's a tremendous amount of in the south fear uh, political, economic, and social changes if you were to get rid of slavery. What would happen economically? Detail $2 billion. Where it's gonna, that money is gone. Uh, uh, politically, are they going to vote? And then socially, what happens? You know, They're going to be dominant in the culture of those states. So if you're white and you're slave, pro-slavery, there's a tremendous amount of pressure to keep it because you don't know what's going to happen next. You get it? Mm -hmm. um, the abolition movement, fundamental, they see it as moral. It's Christian-based, again, religious. Massachusetts and Pennsylvania are two areas that are really hotbed areas for um, abolition movement. Uh, again, their goal is immediate end of slavery period. End of slavery, period. As soon as possible. They will also be anti-expansion. They don't want the spread of slavery. But their fundamental radical attitude is slavery is immoral, it's evil, and it should be ended immediately. No compromise on slavery, the abolitionists. And remember, abolitionists are a very small population in the North. That's a big idea. Let's see. <coughs> a couple of basic things here. 
we remember we talked about the Quakers. Remember the silence, the reading of the silence. Yeah. They they were early, but it wasn't so widespread. It wasn't so strong. It's the 1830s, the Second Great Awakening, is where you see a bump in the popularity of abolitionists. Still, it's a minority, but it starts to grow because of the Great Awakening. Remember the message of the Great Awakening? Wow, well, I don't think you. Uh, that, that's the first Great Awakening. Christian, Christian duty to make the world a more Christian place, to make the world better. So that's why we kick off all those reform movements. Very important. This, this concept, <coughs> what to do with freed slaves? If they were thinking, abolitionists were thinking about this, and what do you think this tell? What, is, what do we learn about abolitionists? But they tried to send freed slaves back to Africa. We create a colony called Liberia, 1822. The American Colonization Society. Okay? Now, this is people in the north saying this. What do you, is there any kind of underlying message here? Anybody else? Nobody? Just you two? Okay, go ahead, Adam. Uh, there's like underlying racial tensions. Was that, what were you going to say? It's totally racist attitudes. The, the northerners, there were like very small population, very, very small population of blacks in the north. Most people did not know or see black people at all um, because they're all in the south. A little bit in the cities in the east, a little bit in Massachusetts, but, but like in the frontier areas, there's really not so many blacks. Now, but here's the thing. They were just as racist as the whites in the South. And they're saying, well, once we free them, what can we do with them? Because we can't live with them. That's the attitude. They had ideas were floated in this era about sending them to a, uh, like a, front, uh, uh, a territory. We'll send them like the Indians. We'll put them over somewhere else like the Indians. That was ideas were put, in, put out. And then this one, well, let's make a colony and send them back to Africa, and which is totally wrong in so many different ways. Number one, they're not African. The slaves that are in America in the 1850s are multi-generational. Multi it's like third, fourth, fifth, sixth generations of, of slaves, okay? So they're not really African. They don't speak the language. They don't know the culture. They don't know how to survive in... Africa. Okay. They built the country. They built the country. They built, for sure, the southern cities and the southern plantations and everything. They invested their time and blood and all this. In, in, so they're American and they built the country. And now we're just going to say, all right, get out. Go back to Africa, which was totally impossible. How much money and how would the logistics be? It's so, smart people thought this would be a solution. They said there were even ideas on, hey, let's compensate the Southerners for their slaves. We'll have the federal government, since we allowed it, federal government allowed it, we'll use federal money to buy the slaves and free them all and compensate the owners, and then we'll, but something has to be done because we can't live with them. Get it? So, a lot of still racial attitudes in the North were just the same as the South. Lincoln is, is one of these. Lincoln does not believe in uh, political equality, social equality, or economic equality of slaves. He, and he does this in the Lincoln-Douglas debates. He's, and I'll show you some documents. He says, look, they're not my equal. I'm, I'm not, they're, they're not my equal. But he qualifies it. And he says, but doesn't mean they can't, they, uh, should be slaves, that you should be owned by someone else. We are, he'll argue, he'll say, um, blacks are equal as humans, as men. Maybe not socially or economically or politically my equal, or you know, intellectually my equal, but they are men just the same, and no man deserves to be owned by another, essentially. It's, it's kind of a um, complicated. 
Go ahead. Uh, was the majority of abolition, were the majority of abolitionists this way, like they wanted to remove <coughs> the uh, uh, black Americans? And send them um, back? Or was that just like, kind of like happened? Probably. Okay. I would say probably. Their attitude is, first of all, there's almost no blacks living in the north. There's very, very few. So it's not an issue. They can say, yeah, free all the slaves, but you know, they, don't, they still have these social hostility towards blacks. Um, as you know, racism in America is still a deal. I mean, it's still going on today. Back then, it was you know, worse. You guys know what classical racism is, right? Classical racism is what the attitude was that was taught in the university. Educated people said, you know, basically were at, taught to believe, yeah, there is a hierarchy of the races. There's a superior and an inferior races. And they based it on, like, the Aryans. This is like the Hitler stuff. Hitler didn't believe, he didn't in, invent this stuff. It was in the 1850s, in the 1840s, 50s, that it, this is the dominant view of the world for Western Civ, saying, well, the Aryans are so great because they, they apply the cultural aspects to race, saying, well, the Aryans were the, basically the Greeks. The Greeks um, had all these wonderful civilization developments and you know, learning and philosophy and theater, all, all these architecture, all of these great cultural developments. And they extrapolate that to say, well, that's why Europe is so advanced and blah, 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 because we are the origins of these people and they are superior racially. And then they throw in, try to throw in biology and say, well, we can measure the size of the brain and all this, try to make it scientific. It's not scientific at all. There's no basis in evidence for it. It's just, it's all interpretation. It's all bias. And so, but this is the attitude all the way through about eight, 19, um, I would say 1940s. This is the dominant attitude for educated people, Western Civ, you know, Europe and America, towards race. Get it? And so they said, yeah, they, well, these people are inferior because of this and that, and taught in the universities. Um, and so that's the dominant thing. That's what Lincoln believes. That's what all these you know, leaders believe. So I think there's not much of this. I think there's some, but generally it's going to be this attitude. Okay. Kind of crazy, isn't it? Fun fact about the uh, uh, abolitionist movement. Most of the abolitionist movement is going to be communicated through pamphlets or newspapers, through the mails. It was illegal in the South to have any abolitionist material. Um, if it was sent to the South, it was through the mail. The, the postmen would not deliver it. The postmasters would throw the stuff away or burn it. They would, it was illegal to, have any ad, to advocate abolition in the South because they're so sensitive to it. If you go down there and you're trying to be an abolitionist, you'd get tarred and feathered, you'd get lynched, you'd get beaten, and you'd run, get run out of town. So it was like, you don't go down there and start messing around with abolition talk. Uh, I was just going to ask, uh, if, if it came down to like, the issue of abolitionists like, speaking, couldn't you just say that they're using the First Amendment? Say anything back to them that they're un where, have you been here for the last six months? Or you, you've been to a Trump rally? Yeah. I have the right to speak. You think they're going to let you speak there? If you're going against Trump? Serious? Uh, I've seen. Really? You don't see people getting beaten up or I've seen harassed? People like both. Uh, yeah. Yeah, oh, or Trump person going to a Trump rally. You know, yeah, or a Trump person going to a, you know, a liberal rally. And going, you know, there was a guy, there was one in um, El Cajon. He was on TV, I remember. Oh, yeah, like he was that. wearing his Trump hat and he's Trump protesting in the middle of like, it was like a Black Lives Matter thing. And guess what happened? He got beat up. He got run out of there. And he's like, well, I have my First Amendment right. Yeah, well, not in a mob, you don't. And it's not wise. You know, the same thing with Trump rallies. Protesters 
Do you remember a guy pro who was protesting at a Trump rally and they escorted him out and some guy whacked him and oh, yeah. knocked him out or hit him? You remember that? Yeah, just spat on him, I think. Yeah, well, yeah. So there's the hostility, pu public hostility towards people who dis who go against the mainstream. Yeah. I just anyway. Said, you said it was illegal, so I don't know. Oh, yeah, the state laws yeah. made it illegal. So the, nobody's protecting civil rights at this time. If you're going to go to court for civil rights, it's a long, drawn-out process. And look what happened to the Cherokees. Cherokees won and still got kicked out, you know. So anyway, here's uh, three leaders you got to know. Theodore Weld, Lyman Beecher, which is the fa father of Harriet Beecher Stowe, and this guy, Elijah P. Lovejoy. Everyone say, Elijah P. Lovejoy. Elijah P. Lovejoy. Isn't that a great name? Yes. A, he was a big abolitionist. He gets murdered in New York State because people didn't like the abolitionists. He's got a printing press and he was printing the abolitionist materials and spreading it out there and, and a mob comes and destroys his printing press the first time. And the second, so he replaces the printing press and the second time, they shoot him, <laughs> so they kill him. Uh, so that relates to this point here, that the abolitionist people were not, uh, were a small population and were host people were hostile to them, both north and south. They were seen as dangerous. Any questions on that? Really? I don't know that. Okay. Sometimes you see Theodore Weld as, an, as a famous abolitionist preacher. Lyman Beecher is really interesting when we get to, uh, when we talk about bleeding Kansas. And here's another one about race. Um, this, remember De Tocqueville? Yeah. So here's, is this north or south? Could you tell? Nothing can be more unfounded and false that all men are born free and equal, for it rests upon the assumption of a fact which is contrary to universal observation. And it could be both. Yeah, I mean, the person you talked to. Were you here when I just explained racial views in the North? Yeah. This is typical North or South. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember what it is. That's, that's something to make you think about it. This is de Tocqueville. You remember de Tocqueville? The French guy. The guy French guy. Observed from the outside. Right. Mm -hmm. He's a great source from 1830s. Well, he's saying here, the most dreadful of all evils that threaten the future of the United States arises from the presence of blacks on its soil. Now, don't misinterpret this. This is not saying black. there's something wrong with blacks. It's saying for problems facing America, race is going to be a big problem. That's what he's seeing, okay? Um, so he's not blaming anyone. He's just saying Things the issue of happen. issues of race are going to be major problems for the Americans. Good, right? well, we still got race issues today, don't we? Yeah. Big, big time. Um, here's a quote. <laughs> Even in the North where slavery was allowed, quote, Dave Tocqueville. It, and so this shows you the racial attitude is north and south. If he presents himself to vote, he runs a risk of to his life. Oppressed, he can complain, but he finds only whites among his judges. His son is excluded from the school where the descendants of Europeans come to be instructed. In theaters, he cannot buy for the price of gold the right to be placed side by side of one who was his master. In hospitals, he lies apart. The black is permitted to beseech God as whites, but not to pray to him at the same altar. Blacks could not vote, testify in court, serve on juries, and most states disallowed new black immigration. They talked about that in the Lincoln reading. Okay, so as time goes on, there's going to be this both north and south racial discriminatory laws for, towards blacks. And that's the, the reality is race is a issue both for the north and the south how can you control the new blacks immigration 
they would just not allow them. They investigate them. They harass them. There's not a lot. Mm -hmm. There's not like a lot. Like if there was one, they would investigate. Well, them. it would be runaway slaves mostly. Yeah, there's not a lot. But they did not want. I can find some in the readings. There were some about like okay. uh, examples where they would say, you know, no, no, free blacks are allowed to live here. Yeah. But there's only this many. So. Okay. <clears throat> Another abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison, he's one of the most outspoken. He, his group is called the American Abolitionist, excuse me, Anti-Slavery Society. So there's three terms you want to get. One, his name, William Lloyd Garrison. Two, his newspaper. And three, the society. This quote just reflects his attitudes. He says, I will be as harsh as truth, as uncompromising as justice. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. This is a, a religious convic convicted person. This is someone who is like, this is the way it is, and I'm going to stand for what I believe in. Very, very outspoken. Was he one of those people that was like, when we let them go, we're going to make sure they go somewhere else or was he uh, they left them? I don't know offhand probably supporting you know they all I think my my sense is that when you talk about freeing slaves you have to do something with them the, the concept of integration is not in anyone's idea no one is saying yeah that's a good idea we'll live with them and then you know so, nobody is saying that that I've ever read and anything I've ever seen on it. So the exclusion, the separation is is definitely the mainstream view. He is probably in that view still. Okay? Clear? Got him? What's his name? William, William Lloyd Garrison. What's his name? William, William Lloyd Garrison. 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 Here's another one. Frederick Douglass. Big star by Frederick Douglass. He's the first African American leader in the United States. He was a former slave. He was a runaway slave. He's got, he's highly gifted, he, you know, intellectual capacities. He's a very, very um, educated and smart and, and high level of intelligence. Um, he goes to Europe. He gets um, education and support. And he comes back to the United States, becomes an advocate for abolition movement. He bought his freedom. His, his uh, what do you call it, newspaper is called the North Star, which was helped guide runaway slaves to the north. Um, he will be a spokesman until about 1880s, and there's another spokesman comes on the scene. He knew Lincoln. Um, you remember the story in the reading about Lincoln and him? Get North Star and get Frederick Douglass, okay? Just make sure you associate those two things. Um, do you remember what it said about Douglas and Lincoln when they met? L Douglas said, Lincoln was the only one who ever t didn't make a point of it to talk about race, to, to point out the racial differences. Does that make sense? That he said, and he knew all these abolitionist leaders, and he says, basically, well, Lincoln, he's the only one that ever treated me on an equal basis and didn't make a point of it to highlight race. So I thought that's kind of a, a thing about Lincoln and how he treated everybody this, you know, pretty much the same. He tried to identify with them. So here's Frederick Douglass. And then here's uh, Garrison. Now, what do you notice about Garrison? He's what? He's the whitest person I've ever seen. <laughs> He's whiter than Richard, you know, and I mean, Richard's pretty dang white. But look, he, he reminds me of a Puritan, doesn't he? Does he remind you of the Puritans, the way they talked, and from yeah. that quote? Yeah. Anyway, I, I You're think... really radical like, he is religious. Radical religious. He's a direct uh, connection to Puritan attitudes in America. Um, is you know, uncompromising with religion and, and issues. And he looks, you know, so white. Okay, anyway. Oh, big idea. This is uh, for the AP exam and, and for the next test. It's really important. Women 
any any African American leader, any women, any African American issue or women's issue, you have to be very strong in. The significance of this is women's rights and the abolition movement are connected. So you have lots of women supporting abolition too. We already know some of these. So uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony should be on here. Lucretia Mott, those were traditional suffrage, suffrage women's rights women, people, okay? Uh, Harriet Tubman, man, you already know her, don't you? She's an underground railroad. Don't, don't spend two seconds. Just make sure if you know that, don't, don't worry about it. Harriet Beecher Stowe, you probably know her already. If you don't, make sure you do. She's the uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin lady. Uh, and then the two that are different, they're special, uh, Sojourner Truth and Angelina and Sarah Grimke. Those are the, those are the ones I want you to, to put a little time in today. Sojourner Truth was a former slave um, and becomes an advocate for women's rights, even a poet. She's got a great story. Her story's in this book. Let's see, should I read it? Sojourner Truth. Ooh, you want to hear it? In 1815, Isabella, a slave girl of about 17, living in Ulster County, New York, married Thomas, an older man who belonged, as she did, to the Dumont family. So this is Sojourner Truth's story. 1815, she met... Her name was Isabella. Over the next 11 years, Isabella bore Thomas five children in between stints of strenuous labor in the fields. New York had recognized the legality of marriages between slaves in 1809, meaning that now the couple and their children could not be sold apart from each other. Isabella herself had been sold away uh, from her own parents at the age of nine for $100. Real life story, isn't it? When their master died and his estate went up for auction, Isabella, okay, when she was sold, okay. Isabella's first owner had been a Dutch American and the child's first language was Dutch. Her next owner, an English speaker, beat her for not comprehending his commands. She was first language was Dutch. Believe that. Her, her back bore the scars for the rest of her life. By 1810, she had been sold twice more, each owner realizing a profit on the transaction, ending up with the Dumas. The state of New York had adopted a program of gradual emancipation, decreeing that slaves born after the 4th of July, 1799, should become free at the age 28, for males 25 for females. This would allow the owner who bore the cost of rearing the child reimbursement with several of their prime working years. Isabella, having been born before the cutoff date, would remain in slavery for the rest of her life. But in 1817, the New York legislature sped up the emancipation process and decreed all remaining slaves, whenever born, should become free. That was 1827 in New York. Masters would receive no financial compensation from the state, but did have one more decade to exploit the chattel's unpaid labor. Shortly before the final emancipation took effect, Isabella's five-year-old son was sold away from her. Believe that? To, to Alabama. The co this constituted a violation of New York law. The newly free Isabella took the remarkable step of suing for obtaining the boy's return an act that set a pattern for her lifetime of resolute opposition to injustice. Sojourner Truth, great story. Tough American story. Okay, so that's Sojourner Truth. The other one is Angela and Sarah Grimke. What's special about them is they're abolitionists in the South. And I think that's a reason that you, need, you should know them. Because it's rare, right? Anything that's odd or rare or... No, they had to leave. They, they, they come out as abolitionists and are basically are forced to leave or have consequences like that. So I don't know of any uh, tarring and feathering, but they did leave. Yeah. Um, what was special about Elizabeth and her family? Elizabeth Caddy Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Okay. Remember, they were uh, early suffrage women's rights issues. Remember from the, the 
the what do we call the Seneca Falls and the Declaration of Sentiments. You remember? Nobody. Yes. Some of you good. Yes. You will pass the AP exam. Southern response to abolition movement. It's a trend that you see act as abolition after 1830. Remember how there was a, lots of emancipation at the end of the, um, like, Washington emancipated his slaves? Yeah. Well, when the abolition movement really kicks off and cotton really kicks off, they stop emancipating slaves. They don't want the freed slaves in the, in the South. Um, they start increasing limits on freed blacks. Um, the biggest thing that the Southerners fear, the biggest fear of the Southerners as what we call slave rebellion, there's four slave rebellions you got to know. The first one is Stono Rebellion, which is in the colonial era. So make, make sure, make a little note, slave rebellions. First one is called Stono Rebellion. Then Gabriel Prosser, Denmark Vesey, and Nat Turner. The, what we're gonna, tomorrow I'm gonna give you an excerpt of what happened with Nat Turner, um, 1830. And that, that's gonna kind of highlight um, the fears. Everyone say, Stono Rebellion? Repeat, Stono Rebellion? Stono Gabriel Prosser? Gabriel Prosser. You should really repeat it. It really, believe it or not, it does help you uh, uh, remember. So we got Stono Rebellion, Stono Rebellion, Gabriel Prosser, Gabriel Prosser, Denmark Vesey, Denmark Vesey, and Nat Turner. Nat Turner. Yeah. So those are gonna be slave rebellions that are gonna highlight the idea. Of what is what are the what are the whites in the South most afraid of? Is slave rebellion. There are about 250,000 freed blacks in the South. Why were those slave rebellions more prominent than the rest? Were there not as many? Those are the only ones that I've really heard about. Um, these were violent uprisings. They were all unsuccessful. They, you know, lots of people suffer. I have this article I'm going to read tomorrow with you. will help clarify it. Um, black codes, remember what these are. These are laws for blacks in the south, but they also had them in the north. They had sli uh, black <laughs> laws in the north. So, uh, and, it, and it depended by state. So just remember, black codes are laws in the south to monitor slavery and to monitor behavior of blacks. Okay, we already did that. Again, we talked about the racism in the north. Let's come back to... S did they ever charge other women? Not that I know of, but probably, depending on how, what they did. Um, Underground Railroad. Did we ever talk about this? No. There is no railroad. It's just... It's yeah. a metaphor. There is yeah. no trains yeah. underground <coughs> taking slaves away to freedom. <coughs> they would Had to clarify that. <laughs> but when you all knew that, though. Yeah. Okay, so... Do you need, uh, we don't need to spend any time in here at Tubman, do we? No. If you ever hear her name, it's going to be in relation to this. I think I heard that she didn't have like one unsuccessful like, escape story. Like I don't know. You want to hear a song? What time do we get out? Seven. Good. We can end with a song. Um, do we have a volunteer who wants to sing it? Go ahead. When the sun comes back and the first girl calls, follow the drinking board, for the old man is awaiting for to carry you to freedom. If you follow the drinking board, the riverbank makes a good road. Could you be a little more monotone? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Dead trees will show you the way. Left foot, leg foot, traveling on. Follow the drinking board. River and between two hills. Follow the drinking board. Uh, there's another river on the other side. Follow the drinking board. Where the magic river meets the little river. Follow the drinking board. Where the old man is awaiting for, to carry the freedom if you follow the drinking board. Okay, good. Um, wonderful. What is the drinking board? Excuse me. Stop and focus. We're not done. 
What is the drinking gourd? The past freedom. It's the Big Dipper. So this was a song from the era. It's very typical. Slaves would sing in the fields, etc. And they would send messages, hidden messages in the songs. This is a, a directions on how to escape, how to get away. And the master, remember there, they would have these like spirituals, like Moses songs, right? That's all about someday we're getting free, we're going to get free. The overseers, the whites, didn't pay attention to it. And so therefore it was kind of a communication system for a hidden for the for uh, for blacks and slaves How at the time. How would one plantation slaves on one plantation talk to another? Like, um, they would go and visit. Like they could escape for a small amount of time. No. Follow the drinking gourd. Follow the drinking. 